welcome to the Pastor Peter United Methodist Church. We're so happy that you, uh, you're here to worship with us today, uh, to be with your brothers and sisters in Christ and to join together and, uh, and sing. And um, we're glad that you chose to be here this morning uh, as we before we before we get started, we're going to hear a bit of an update. As you uh, may be aware, we uh, we went on uh, we, uh, we had our capital campaign over during the fall. And so we're going to get an update about how those things are going. So Kenny Short Sleeve is going to share that with us. Buenos dias, Iglesia. Good morning, church. Good morning. In the fall of 2018, our church launched a debt elimination campaign that we called Imagine What's Ahead to free up monies for ministry and maintain in our church. Say what? Our image was a winding road with curves and hills finally reaching our destination point of being debt free. We embarked down this road with faith and determination. The church responded by pledging to fuel our trip with nearly $1.2 million. That's $1.2 million of the $1.5 million we needed to reach our destination. So far to date, we've received our first fruit pledges of $301,000. That's $301,000. Thank you, church. A big thanks to those folks. This helped to fuel our trip by moving us out of our church parking lot onto the road. This gave us necessary funds to immediately begin paying and reducing our debt and interest payment to the Texas Methodist Foundation. Now we're off to a great start. We're counting on, counting on our remaining pledges of $892,000 to fuel our trip to this road to freedom. But we still need to find a way to raise an additional $330,000, that's right, additional $330,000 to fund our trip so we can get over that last hill to be debt free. If you missed out on getting on board to our destination of being debt free, it's not too late. We still have plenty of seats available. As we get closer to our destination, we'll begin to see, new, see road signs of new ministry opportunities to be fisher of men, women, and children, and to maintain our beautiful church facility from which we can launch these ministries by paying off our entire fuel bill. Come on board, join in with others, buckle your seat, the ride has begun. Thank you, Kenny, for that update, and now let us prepare our hearts for worship. Stand as you are able and join me in the call to worship. We have come from different backgrounds on various roads to get here, but we are all here seeking the experience of the holy. Listen for the promise of God's steadfast love and God's faithfulness. We are listening for God's call in our lives. Holy One, earth. Open our minds to your breathtaking work in the world, even as you call us to spread the good news of Jesus Christ, our mentor and savior, in whose name we pray. Amen. Two Christian men. 
While you uh, remain standing, take a moment to greet one another and pass the peace of Christ. And I'd like to invite the children's choir to come forward. They're going to sing for us before uh, everyone else will join for the children's moment.
job. If y'all want to have a seat, if all the other children would like to come up and join us for children's time. Hey, can you turn that mic so people can hear your answer? I'm so glad you're all here this morning. You're going to help me. Uh, we're going to put Mr. Chase on the hot seat, get to know him a little bit better this morning. If you haven't met him yet, Mr. Chase is our new director of music here at AUMC, and he has agreed to answer a few questions so everybody can get to know him a little bit more. And the children in Sunday school uh, wrote out a few questions of things they wanted to know, and then if you're feeling brave enough, we'll just take some from the kids who are here this morning. All right, so the kids would love to know what your favorite food is. Pizza. Good call. I think they all like that, too. Um, is there any food that you just really don't like at all? Mm, I don't really like squash. Squash. I know I probably should. What about you guys? Do you like squash? Mm. Okay, I think they're, they're with you for the most part. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I know. Um, when you were their age, what was your favorite subject in school? Music, obviously. <laughs> um, I like English, too, though. Yeah. Okay. English. Uh, do you have any brothers or sisters? Nope. Mm -hmm. I'm an only child. Only child. Anybody else here an only child? We've got a few. Okay. Got to stick together. <laughs> um, they wanted to know if you have a favorite hymn or song. Oh, it's too hard to pick. No, I'm sorry. Too many to choose from. Um, do you have any hobbies other than music? Um, yeah, I like really like to go to museums. I like movies. You guys like that stuff, too. Yeah. And do you have any pets? I have a cat. She's very fluffy. A fluffy cat. So does that mean you're more of a cat person than a dog person? Uh, I like dogs, too, though, so it's too hard. No, I love them both. Love them both. All yeah. right. Well, I don't know, guys. What do you think? Is there anything else you're just dying to know? Nice. His favorite dessert? That's a good favorite question. Mm. I don't think he likes something chocolate. Chocolate, okay. Dark chocolate. But favorite store. What's your favorite store? Store. Favorite store. We got a store. shopper over Ooh. here. He wants to know your favorite store. No idea. Amazon? Uh, I like Gap. <laughs> Favorite vegetable. Oh, um, hey, Anne, it's okay. Probably spinach, which is weird. It is weird. Yeah. 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 Okay. Sorry. Maybe I don't know any play video games. I used to love Nintendo, so I like Super Super Mario and Super Mario. stuff like that. Okay, Annalise, last question. Favorite fruit. We're all about food here. Citrus something. Like uh, oranges. oranges, probably. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much, yeah. Mr. Chase, for playing along with us this morning. <laughs> Let's say a prayer. Dear God, thank you for today. Thank you for your love. And thank you for Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for bringing Mr. Chase to our church family. Amen. Okay, awesome. You guys, if you want to go to Sunday school, Miss Lauren is going to escort you this morning, or you can head back to your seats.
you prepare to enter a time of, of prayer, I'd like to invite you to take a moment to lift up the needs that you have or the needs that you know of other people um, and take a moment for a silent prayer and reflection. And after a moment of silent prayer, then I'll lead on with the pastoral prayer. Let us pray. Lord, thank you for this day that you've given us, uh, a day where we can come together and join in one voice and in one spirit to worship, worship you, God. You are, you are worthy of praise and adoration. We thank you for giving us the diverse body that is the church, that even though we come from different backgrounds, we have different ideas, different approaches to the world, and different dreams for our, for our lives and for our families— that through this body that's known as the church, you've pulled us together with one goal, to see your kingdom of peace and love reign on this earth so that all will see your glory and feel your love. Help us to always strive together towards attaining that goal. I wanna, we want to lift up those in our congregation this morning that are sick, that are dealing with, with illnesses. Uh, we want to pray for those that have... Um, recently had surgery and have begun the long road to recovery. Uh, and we also pray for those who have been on the road to recovery for a while, that you would continue to send healing, that, uh, they, would, that they would feel your peace and strength. We also want to lift up those in our congregation that are dealing with, that are mourning the loss of a loved one. Uh, for those who, um, who, who have, who have, uh, who have been, been dealing with the mourning for quite a while, and for those to which the loss is just is recent, God. We pray that your peace would surround them, that you would, you would surround them with family and friends that would help them to feel love, to let them know that as they go through this time of mourning, they are not walking alone, that they are in your thoughts. We want to pray a prayer of blessing over the manna bags that were made by the youth this weekend. We thank you, God, for those who gave to those supplies and for those who spent the time to put them together. We pray as these these uh, bags full of, of all sorts of necessities, of, of warm socks and of food and of, of, of hygiene products. We pray, God, that those, those are distributed to those in our community that are in need, that those that receive them would not only receive the comfort that comes from the, the items that are in the bags, but also comfort to know that, 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 you, that you have a plan for them, that, that regardless of where they found themselves in their, in their life and their, their current struggles, that that they have a God that cares for them and that if they would, um, they, they would turn to you for help and, and God help them to know that there are people in their, their community as well that, that, have, uh, that feel, feel for them and are praying for them and want to, want, want to help them. We lift up our, the, the general conference that's going to be happening over the next week. We pray that your spirit would work during this conference, that it would be on all the delegates that as they, as they, um, as they make decisions and discern your, your plan for, uh, for, for our denomination, that you would, you would be with them during this week. And I pray, God, that you would continue to move in our congregation, that you would rest your spirit on our hearts and on our minds, that as we work together towards the common goal that you've given us, that we would, that we would feel your love, that we would emanate it into our community, that, that those that uh, encounter, encounter, um, encounter the people from this church would, would know that, that that God is at work and has and, and loves them. Uh, we ask all these things in the name of our Lord Jesus, who taught us when we gather to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
thank you, choir, for that, for that beautiful song. It uh, sets the stage for what we're talking about. Uh, this morning, we are um, continuing our sermon series uh, that we've called Say What? Which, with my voice, I apologize in advance. I can't really get as high with the cold that I have that reference for the Say What? But we're, <laughs> we're, we're looking at uh, times in the scripture where Jesus says things to his disciples and uh, to us that seem a little strange, a little um, counterintuitive, countercultural, uh, in, in a way that, that causes you to pause and think, how, how can, why are, you why, why are you telling us this, Lord? Why, how are we supposed to put this in action in our life? And our uh, scripture this morning comes from the book of Luke, chapter 5, and we're going to be reading verses 1 through 11. Once, while Jesus was standing beside the lake of Gennesaret, and the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he saw two boats there at the shore of the lake. The fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little way from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the crowds from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep water, and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we have worked all night long, but have caught nothing. Yet, if you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done this, they caught so many fish that their nets were beginning to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats, so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For he and all who were there were with him were amazed at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. Then Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching people. When they had brought their boats to shore, they left everything and followed him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious God, thank you for sending Jesus for the record of his ministry that you have in, your, in the Gospels. I pray, God, that uh, as I teach the next few minutes, that what I say would be pleasing to you and that it would be uh, used to build up your church. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Is there anyone uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in the church here today that likes to fish? Yeah, all right, I'm seeing lots of hands, lots of hands. Now, uh, is there anyone here who kind of fancies themselves a master fisher? I see, a, I see a couple of hands there. We had some brave souls at 8.30 as well who also said that. Well, if you're not one of those uh, uh, master anglers, but you might know someone in your family who is, you know that those, the, the master anglers like to, fan like to fancy themselves able to best the craftiest of fishes. There's no fish in the water that they can't catch. You've got the, they've got their favorite baits, their lures, their rods. They get their technique perfected, almost with the same amount of superstition and ritual that you see a batter coming up to the plate uh, for his, for his at-bat. You just have to do things just right. Now imagine, if you're one of those master anglers, You've been out on the water all day, and you haven't had a single bite. You're frustrated, you're tired, and you decide to head to shore. As you're cleaning stuff up and gathering your things and getting ready to leave, someone approaches you and says, Hey, I saw you out there. I saw that you were struggling. I've got some tips for you I think that's going to help you out. Get back in your boat, head out into the water, go to this place, cast on this side of the boat, and move your hand just so. If you do what I say, I guarantee you, you're going to catch some fish. How would you respond to that? Would you take it with a spirit of cheerfulness? Would you say, okay, yeah, I'm gonna, I'll, 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 I'll get my stuff, I'll go back out there. I, I think you've got, I think you've got some, some, some good words for me. Or would you tell that guy to take a dive? There's no way that's going to work. I've been out there for hours. I know what I'm doing. Seriously, the nerve of that guy. P. 
Peter faced some similar circumstances in our passage today. They had been out on the water all night. They were fishermen. They were professionals, and they hadn't caught anything. Jesus is out teaching people by the lake. So he decides after he sees the boats to get Simon uh, Peter to take him out a little ways into the water so he could teach from the boat. And after he's done that for a while and taught the crowds, Jesus tells Peter, why don't you paddle out a little further out into the water and cast your nets out there? You're going to get a catch. Peter says, well, uh, we haven't had a bite all night, but okay, you know, since you said it, I'll, I'll, I'll go give it a try. And he does it. And there's, receives an amazing catch. It took two boats, and the boats were dipping down into the water because there were so many fish. Their nets were breaking. It was just, it was, it was amazing, and it floored everybody who was there. Simon gets down on his knees and says, Lord, I'm not, I'm not worthy. And, 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 and Jesus tells him, don't worry. I've got a plan for you. And then Jesus tells him what his plan is going to be. How he's going to do great things in his name. And when I was looking at that, looking at this scripture, I started to think, what made, what made Simon Peter listen and obey Jesus' words? Something in the words that Jesus said drew those people to him, made them want to stay, made them want to listen to what he had to say. They were captivated by this man and his message, and this man who said that he had a word from God. And, and that's something that people have wanted from the beginning of time, to hear a message from the divine, to have that communication with God, to hear him speak, to know what God, what pleases God. That's driven all sorts of endeavors, divination, prayer, interpreting signs from natural phenomena. You know, in the time of the, in time of the Old, Old Testament, people would, would, would uh, read the intestines of animals to try and get a message from God. People want to hear from God. And this is all done in the service of hearing from God. But then Jesus came, and he said he was the word of God in the flesh. He came to live in the middle of creation. And he had a message from God to share. And the message that he gave was so compelling to those that heard it, that they sought to get near to him, as near as they possibly could. And they did at great, ex great cost to follow him. And the words that Jesus said, he had a lot of things to say. When Jesus taught, he addressed both these high-level spiritual truths about his mission and his status as the Son of God. But Jesus also spoke about a lot of things that were meant to tell his followers how they were to live in their day-to-day -day life. And often these words from God seemed strange counterintuitive, countercultural, running counter to human nature. Jesus was doing far more than telling his followers how to fish. He was telling them how to live their lives. And the crazy thing about these messages that Jesus was giving to his followers was that no matter how countercultural, counterintuitive they seemed to be at first, it seems like he really meant for us to do them. And so, some of these things are things that we've heard so many times before in the church that, you start, that it, it starts to lose the significance of what Jesus was saying, how, how counter-cultural these things are, how different from the programmed human nature that we have that these messages are. Statements like in Matthew 20, verses 26 through 28. When Jesus tells his disciples how they're supposed to aspire to greatness, he says, But whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be your slave, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. If you want to be great, you've got to be a servant. If you want to be first, you must be a slave. Jesus, in this statement, is challenging the very fundamentals of the, the, the power grab that so many people go for. The idea that as you consolidate power for yourself, you get so much out of it. There's so much personal benefit to having 
power. But God says, no, if you want to be great in the kingdom of heaven, you have to be a servant. You have to give something up. It's going to cost you. And Jesus called his followers to it. And then he modeled it for himself as the ultimate example of the servant leader. Jesus also goes against the common understanding of an eye for an eye, which is something that exists even to this day. You see it listed in, in, some, in the great codes of law that archaeologists have discovered all the way up to now. The idea is that in certain circumstances, retribution is an acceptable response. But Jesus turned it on its head. He says, you've heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil, but if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. The idea of an eye for an eye is something that is so ingrained in, in, you know, in, in human society that if there are causes and effects, consequences and actions, that sometimes you deserve to have, you deserve what's coming to you. But Jesus is saying, no more. I've got a different plan for my followers. I'm changing things. Or, or how about when Jesus taught about how his followers were supposed to react to their enemies? He said, you've heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is, heaven, who is in heaven. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? What Jesus is saying here is that his disciples are supposed to take love further than what is expected of them. He called out in his example the tax collectors and Gentiles as an example that his Jewish audience would have understood. Tax collectors were those who, they were, they were, they were Jewish, but they worked for Rome. They took the money of their people and, and sent it to Rome. And in the eyes of a lot of people, they betrayed their own countrymen. And then the Gentiles were people that they would have assumed, oh, we're not supposed to associate with those people. They're, they're outside of where... Where uh, they're outside of, of, of those people that we're supposed to be around. But Jesus says, even those people who you don't think are acceptable, they already love those who love them. That's a given. But my disciples are supposed to love others so deeply that they can love even those who hate him. Because love is a quality that Jesus wants his people to show. And that's a hard thing. To love those that don't love you. To even take it further than that, to love those who hate you. But Jesus is calling it, and, and, and when you read it, sometimes you can think, wow, what? I'm supposed to do that? And then Jesus also told his disciples not to do the one thing that I find myself doing all the time. And that's being anxious about my life in the future. He says, therefore I tell you, don't be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing? And after Jesus says that, he, he, gives, he gives examples to his disciples of how God takes care of nature, how even the birds of the field are taken care of by God and given food to eat, and how, the, 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 how uh, plants are made to grow and receive everything, how God keeps the natural environment functioning and working just the way he wants it to. And he says, well, you know, if God takes care of the world— in that way, don't doubt that he also is going to take care of you and he loves you. But again, these are things that are hard. I'm not supposed to worry about the future. I'm not supposed to worry about where my next meal is going to come from or what I'm, the clothes I'm going to put on my children. I'm supposed to just give that to God and, and say, all right, God, I know you're going to take care of me. These things are hard that Jesus is, expecting, is asking of us. And these are just some of the examples of how Jesus told his disciples far more than how to simply fish. Jesus, God in the flesh, came and lived with us and understood us. And then he gave us an example of what his followers were supposed to do 
in order for the world to look like God wants it to. Wants to want, in order for the world to look like the dream that he has, a place of love and trust and care and forgiveness. And he asks us to trust him enough to do it. To do it even when what he calls us to do is difficult. To know that God, God will help us through, that if, if he asks us to do something, he will be there to provide the help when we ask. And that's where all the words of Jesus end up calling us to trust. Trust that you believe who he is, who he, you believe that he is who he says he is. Trust that he loves us enough and wants the best for us. Trust that God is ultimately in control. And now we as Christians, we as people who have professed to be followers of Jesus, to have our lives informed by him, we have a choice to make. Do we hear the words of Jesus and do like Peter, who went back out with his nets and cast them into the water in spite of not catching anything all night? Who, when he had an opportunity to balk at someone teaching him how to do his job, he said, no, Lord, I'm going to do it. And he did it and received a display of the power of God at that moment. Or do we hear Jesus' words and answer back with a say what? Don't tell me how to fish. Don't tell me how to live my life. All that serving and turning of the other cheek and loving stuff, that's not going to make a difference. I can't do that. That's not going to change the world. But here's the tough question that Jesus asks us this morning. Do you trust me? Do you trust that what I've called you to do is the will of God, that it will make a difference in your life, that it will make a difference ultimately in the world? That's our call this morning, to trust in him to search his word, to read the Gospels, to let Jesus tell us how to fish, knowing that it will make a difference. Believe it. Live it. Let us pray. Gracious God, thank you for sending your son Jesus, God in flesh, to teach us how it is, to t teach us how to fish, Lord, and teach us so much more than that, to teach us how to love, how to live, how to forgive, to show us what it is that God has for the world, the dream that he has. I pray, God, that you would send your Holy Spirit on each of the person that's here. Help us, God, to walk with you and to see you and to turn to you for help when we need it, knowing that you're there, that you answer, that you have a plan. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. As we sing the summons. standing as we affirm our faith together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, 
born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit.
before we go, I wanted to uh, invite you. Uh, there's information about it in your bulletin as well, but at 1230, there's going to be a children's ministry planning in the parlor. So if you would like to have some, uh, be involved in some of the, in the discussions about children's ministry over the next year, you can join Leanne uh, for, for that. Uh, and, oh wow, I say that's all the announcements that I have. The other one's not, doesn't count anymore because it's already happened. Uh, now friends, as you go from this